I'd just like to acknowledge at the outset that this is a sensitive subject. Um, what I shall bring out from the Bible I shall try to do very carefully. Uh, I do not intend my remarks to be glib or thoughtless. Uh, and neither am I unaffected by what I shall say this evening. Like many in this room, I have an, a measure of experience of what it means to suffer. And this, therefore, is not just a theoretical approach of what the Bible says about the topic, but one which is underpinned, as I say, by a measure of experience. Now, suffering is very much part of what it means to be human. It's probably fair to say that every human that, that ever lives by and large, will experience suffering of one kind or another at some point in their life. And so we must be careful, therefore, not to make assumptions about one another. Uh, some people's sufferings can be, be very public, uh, and others can be very private. We may not ever know of them, uh, and if we do, it may only be disclosed to, to one or two. So don't let's assume that because somebody seems to have a good life around us, uh, a simple life, an easy life. Don't let's assume that they are immune to suffering, because as I said already, suffering is linked to being what it means to be human. And suffering can be physical or mental, <coughs> or both. Suffering comes from different sources. We can have natural disasters, the big things. We can have refugee crises, which we've seen uh, in recent times. And they can be, on a local level, can't they? They can be others' actions or others', wo others words that can affect us for, for a short period of time or, f or for longer. Suffering can also be self-induced from time to time. It can come as a result of an accident or an incident, as illness, bereavement, stress, pressure. There's lots of types of suffering. And it can come on different levels, can't it? It can affect just us, it can affect our immediate family, it can affect our community, like our, our meeting here in rugby. Uh, it can affect us nationally about where we live in the world uh, and it can affect us internationally, certainly, again, uh, the refugee crisis has, has certainly demonstrated that. But as I've already intimated, it, it doesn't really matter how we look at it. Suffering, in whatever form it takes, is ultimately a direct result of us being human. And more than that, being mortal. We are dying creatures. It's a biological fact that we are dying from the day we are born. Depressing, I know, but it's true. So suffering, I suggest, is linked to us being mortal human beings. Now those who question the existence of God sometimes say, well, how can a God of love permit such things as war, sickness, pain, death, especially when those effects are often uh, are felt most keenly by those who are apparently innocent. That will be their claim. How can innocent people suffer and there be a God of love? How can God look at that and it be okay? <coughs> and importantly, this line of reasoning, in, in this line of reasoning, the younger the individual who suffers, the harder it is to be accepted. Now, despite medicine's best efforts, an older person can sometimes die an uncomfortable, slow, uh, and sometimes painful death from one of many degenerative conditions. Cancer, uh, other sort of heart lung conditions, vascular conditions, they can be slow and painful despite whatever medicine can offer them. But these things, I would suggest, when it happens to an older person, are broadly accepted as part of the human condition. It's what happens when we get old, some will say. However, and I think very much more understandably, as human beings, we find it much harder to accept that same level of suffering when it affects a younger person. You see, a younger person is perceived by the world around us as having a right to a life that was ahead of them and innocent of such suffering. Again, I use that word carefully. Now, when we turn to the Bible, we find that God's word actually questions this notion of mankind being innocent. And I think this is perhaps the key to unlocking <coughs> how we, we square that circle that, that those that don't believe in God might sometimes pose to us. The Bible asks us to recognise that mankind was created by God. And it is therefore presumptuous for us to question God and his motives. 
We read in Romans, Shall the thing formed say to the thing that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? And again in, in the scriptures, in, this time in Genesis chapter 18, Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? So let's be careful if we ever go along this line of thinking, of, of questioning God. Perhaps the better attitude is that God knows best in these things, as we shall come on to in, in a little while. So what does the Bible say about suffering? Well, in the very beginning, in, in the Genesis account of the creation of the heavens and the earth, God described the heavens and the earth as being very good. And the Bible tells us that God created first the man Adam, as we know, and then out of Adam he created the first woman, Eve. And in the passage of time, by the time we get to Genesis chapter 3, we learn that Adam and Eve disobeyed God, and as a result of that they were thrown out of the Garden of Eden. And God also cursed Adam and Eve, didn't he? Uh, and he pronounced the sentence of mortality upon Adam and upon Eve and upon their descendants, uh, what we might refer to as mankind. Let's just read a couple of verses from Genesis 3 to remind ourselves. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. Genesis 3 verse 17. And unto Adam, he, that's God, said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. But God also promised a way of escape from sin and death, a means of salvation in the form of a promised Messiah, described here in Genesis as the seed of the woman, one particular offspring of Adam and Eve, of the woman, sorry, one particular offspring of, of, of the woman, uh, of mankind, as it were, the Son of God and the Son of Man. The Lord Jesus Christ, who we're told in the Gospels, he who would save his people from their sins. Now this link then between Adam's sin and the curse of death and that of the promised salvation in Jesus Christ is summarised for us in the New Testament. It's picked up in a number of places, but I'd like us to go back, please, if you were here this morning, back to Romans 5. And this is a purely a coincidence, uh, nevertheless a useful one. nice when you offer a selection of Bible talks and you put them in order of preference and they pick the third order of preference and that's what happened this evening but that's how we're here, here now in Romans 5 so Romans 5 and verse 17 Romans 5 verse 17 for if by one man's offence now that's Adam that's being talked about let's be clear about that if by one man's offence death reigned by one What's that saying? Well, we've seen in Genesis that the curse of sin and death was passed upon all of mankind. So if by one man's offence death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the, the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So by the actions of one man, says the scriptures, sin and death entered the human race. So by the actions of one man, says the scriptures, the Lord Jesus Christ, there is a promise of grace and a gift of life by Jesus Christ. And then similar, similar language then, verse 18, Therefore as by the offence of one, Adam, judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one, that's Jesus Christ, italics there, the free gift, uh, came upon all men unto the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offence might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. 
So sin is contrasted to the grace of God that can count people as righteous and death is contrasted to eternal life which has been made possible by the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the antidote. And in, a, in a sort of a, a nutshell, that is suffering. And that is the answer to the suffering of the world. But sorry for those that are looking to get away. I'm not going to sit down just yet. Now Romans 6 then picks up very much the same argument. And it's nice how the scriptures sometimes layer our summaries. Uh, and that short section we've read from verses 70 to 21, I think is perhaps summarised then in one verse. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, 4, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <coughs> now the Bible talks, I think, I think we can categorise it into two categories, two, two types of suffering. It talks about suffering associated uh, with being a mortal human being. And it also talks specifically about suffering because of our faith in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's just think about those uh, as those two categories. So first of all, let's just think about what the Bible says about suffering which is common to man. Suffering which is, affects all human beings as mortal offspring of Adam and Eve. Now Ecclesiastes chapter 9, I'll just read this verse to you. Ecclesiastes 9 is, is I think colloquially going to tell us that good things don't just happen to good people and bad things don't just happen to bad people that's not the way God works so Ecclesiastes 9 and we read these verses I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong neither yet bread to the wise nor yet riches to men of understanding nor yet favour to men of skill but time and chance happeneth to them all for man also knoweth not his time as the fishes that are taken in an evil net, as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time, <coughs> when it falleth suddenly upon them. And the analogy there from, from the hunter is that the fishes that are in the net and the ones that are out, it's not as a result of what the fish has done. It's, they just happen to be swimming in the wrong patch of the water. And so with the bird that gets caught in that particular snare. So, says the scriptures, is the analogy of when... Things befell man to cause them to die, that affects their mortality. It's described as time and chance. But, as many have said before, there's only one thing guaranteed in life, or two things, as the world will say, death and taxes, but ultimately, mortality will get us all. Uh, if Christ remains away, then the day of our death will come to us all. Some sooner, sadly, some uh, others, they'll live a longer life. But that's the point of Ecclesiastes, I think. Time and chance happen to all. And what did Jesus then say about suffering? I would like you to come with me to this one. Luke chapter 13, please. It's always good to see what Jesus says about <coughs> suffering because we're much less likely to gainsay it, are we? Luke chapter 13. Uh, and I want to look at verse, uh, the first five verses of Luke chapter 13. There were present at that season some that told Jesus, him, of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these, that these Galileans were sinners above all of the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. I repeat, bad things don't just happen to bad people and good things don't just happen to good people. Those who died when the tower in Siloam fell upon them weren't guilty of any particular kind of sin. They died, says Jesus, because they were mortal. And we will all die an endless death unless we repent of sin and accept the salvation that has been offered in the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> we shall all likewise perish. Bringing it a little closer to home, those who died in the tragic events surrounding the destruction of the Twin Towers in September 2011 
didn't die as a result of any particular sins that they had committed. They died because they were mortal. Uh, And bring it even closer to home just for a moment, when we lost our second child, James. He didn't die because of any sins he had committed or that Hannah and I had committed. He died because he was mortal. And, And we get a similar thread, don't we? Let's go to John chapter 9 just for a moment, because the Jews had a problem with this idea of of sin, sins that we have committed, therefore we suffer. And therefore the ones, the people that seem to suffer the most must be the, the people that have done the worst things. But that's not the way that God works. We all suffer the effects of mortality in one way or another, at some point or another. Uh, and the people, the Jews, bring to Jesus in John chapter 9, a man who had been born blind from his birth, says John 9 and verse 1. And in verse 2, his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents? That is, that he was born blind. And Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but the work that the works of God may be made manifest in him. And that's a beautiful miracle of a man that never sees Jesus until after he's been healed, because he departs from Jesus with the clay on his eyes, and he comes back, and Jesus says, do you believe on the Messiah? And he says, uh, show me, Lord, who is he? And Jesus says, you have both seen him, past tense, and it is you that he that talks with you. So it is possible for us to see Jesus without ever seeing him for ourselves face to face. That's the effect of our faith, and, and that's why uh, this man's experience is, is recorded for us, to learn this, that it wasn't as a particular result of the man's sins or his parents. Of course they did sin. Everybody has sinned and come short of the glory of God. We looked at that if you were here this morning. But there's no particular sin that resulted in this man's suffering is the point that John chapter 9 makes. And we're not going to turn this up because it's too big a subject, but let's just think about Job. You may have heard of Job. Um, He is described by God as being a righteous man, upright, fearing God and eschewing evil. Uh, And this man was righteous and yet he lost everything. He suffered in a way that very few of us uh, have ever or are ever likely to suffer. He's described as being one of the greatest men of the East in Job chapter 1 and verse 3. But he loses his cattle and most of his servants. He loses his sons and his daughters, probably older if not young adults. He himself is inflicted with terrible health conditions, sore boils from the top of his head to, to his toes. And what does he do when he endures these sufferings? Well, we're told in Job chapter 1 and verse 20 that he worships God. And we're told in verse 21 that he recognises his creator, that everything that we ever have, what we stand up in, the way we live, we breathe, our families, the food we eat, the clothes we put on our back, our health, It's all given by God. And what does he not do, importantly? Well, this man, he never blames God. Job 1 and verse 22, and neither Job 2 and verse 10 does he sin with his lips. He doesn't curse God, doubt God, question the love of God. And what happens to him in the end? Well, he receives double. He's even more blessed at the end than he was at the beginning. And and in a similar fashion... That's the promise that's been offered to us, isn't it? We have been offered the gift of eternal life in a kingdom of righteousness and peace ruled over by the Lord Jesus Christ, none of which we deserve or earn, but has been offered to us as the gift of God by grace. So let's just pause and consider what we've learned so far. Well, we've suggested that suffering is part of what it means to be human because suffering ultimately links to the fact that we are mortal. And by being human as the offspring of Adam and Eve, we are under the curse of sin (coughs) and death. We are all destined to die. We've already mentioned that several times. But God has provided us a way of escape from sin and death through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've considered that suffering which is common to man, suffering which we are all vulnerable to in one form or another, as a result of being human. But these things we have suggested are never as a direct result of a particular sin that we have committed. That's not the way God works. 
Now, the Bible uses different terms for, for suffering, if we like. Um, one word I do want us to consider, it's a little bit obscure. It doesn't come up very often, but it's in Hebrews chapter 12. But I do think it's worth us looking at this for a moment. So Hebrews chapter 12, please. And I want to go in at verse 5 for now. Actually, verse 4 for connection. The early part of Hebrews 12 is talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. And in contrasting the audience of Hebrews 12 to the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 4 says, But ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. You have forgotten, verse 5, the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If he endure chastening, God dealeth with his <coughs> sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if he be without chastisement, whereof all our partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits uh, and live? And that word chastening comes again in verse 11. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Now that word that's translated as chastening, the Greek word, <coughs> comes mainly here. It also comes in, in 1 Timothy, and it's, sorry, in 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, and it's the word translated as correction. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So I'm going to suggest here now, and I would be very happy to discuss this afterwards, that this chastening, bearing in mind we've already said that God doesn't operate on a, on a basis by you have done wrong, therefore I'm going to punish you by some form of suffering. I don't think that's what Hebrews 12 is talking about. That's not, as we've said, the way God works. But in the fact that it occurs in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16 in the context of the word of God correcting us, then yes. Let me put it this way. The truth of the gospel is unnatural. It asks us to resist everything that comes naturally to us. Hatred, anger, wrath, malice. And to put on characteristics that are not normal human characteristics. But are characteristics of our God. Long-suffering, mercy, goodness. So it's unsurprising that the word of God will constantly rebuke us. If we read it. In fact, it's, if we are to follow Jesus, it's described as taking up our cross and following him. It's a painful process. Conforming to the will of God and to the word of God hurts. And I think that's the chastening. That when we have done wrong, the word of God will correct us. And it's how we <coughs> respond to that. Will we allow it to correct us? Will we go through the process that the scriptures lay down when we have done wrong? Will we seek God's forgiveness? Will we be humbled by it? And will we try again harder in the future? I think that's the kind of chastening that the Hebrews 12 is talking about. So God causes us to suffer, if we like, through his word, if we are to become followers of him and of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I accept that that is a, an obscure passage, but I, want, I did want to touch on it. Uh, and, and again, I will discuss that afterwards. Uh, but it's about learning to make personal sacrifices in accordance to the will of God. I think that's what Hebrews 12 is talking about. But the scriptures spend a lot more time talking about things which my Bible, the King James Bible, I know many of you read this too. Uh, it turns it as tribulation. Now I think tribulation is what we've been considering mostly this evening so far. The suffering which is common to man. Let's just look then what... Uh, the scriptures say about this. I'll, I'll read these verses for you. We've got to move forward because of time. But uh, Acts 14 and verse 22. Uh, the apostles confirm, uh, exhort the disciples to continue in the faith that we, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. <coughs> and we looked also at Romans chapter 5 this morning that we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience or endurance. Uh, endurance, experience, and experience hope. So what, is, what are we saying there then? Well, we've already said, and I'm going to reiterate it yet again, that God doesn't operate on the basis of, 
I punish you because of a sin you have done. That's not what the scriptures teach us. But whatever suffering we come across because of our mortality, it's how we respond to it. It's how we will grow in our experience and our appreciation, like Job did. He was righteous, and yet he suffered tribulation. And yet he never sinned. He never turned his back on God. He put his trust wholly in God, recognised his creator for who he was, and so grew in his experience uh, and put his hope in God. Romans 8 also (coughs) talks about the effect of tribulation. No matter how hard it gets, no matter how painful it is, no matter how bad the sufferings of our mortality are, Romans 8 gives us some wonderful encouragement. Verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Romans 12 and verse 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation. Continuing instant <coughs> in prayer. And that's really where we come then to our reading that we have from 2 Corinthians chapter 1 that talks about the, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ as the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. <coughs> you see, it's not that God doesn't know or God doesn't care, and neither would I limit God in his ability to do anything, but we're looking at the pattern of the human condition. The curse of sin and death and the promise of life in the Lord Jesus Christ. God knows. God knows that our mortality hurts us. That we will suffer as a result of it. And he has provided a a comfort in his word and a promise in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that promise, says the scripture, is dependent upon him being raised from the dead, verse 9. That we have that sentence of death in ourselves. That we should not trust in ourselves. That's what our mortality teaches us. We think we're big, we're clever, we're young, we're invincible, but then we're not backed by mortality. Not stricken down by God, but not backed by our mortality. And then we think, yeah, actually, we're not quite as invincible as we thought we were. We're not quite as strong as we thought we were. We have not to trust in ourselves, but we learn in our experience of suffering to put our trust in our God. That God says, verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 1, that can raise us from the dead as he did Lord Jesus Christ, who delivered us from so great a death and doth deliver deliver in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. That's the God of all comfort that the scriptures teach us about. Now there's one other facet of suffering before I I sit down that that I think um, comes from a particular source. And probably described most closely in the first letter to Peter, through Peter. So 1 Peter, please, and just let's establish this theme very briefly. And we're going to link now that the, the salvation that has been given us in the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel to which we are called, we are called to identify with the sufferings of Christ. Christ who never sinned, who suffered at the hands of wicked men for who he was and for what he preached. We are called to identify ourselves with that man. And because of everything that God teaches us is against the course of man, man without God is going to resist us. He's not going to like what we say or do. We will come. Uh, we, we will suffer as a result of, of the faith which we begin to, to learn and commit to. And this is what 1 Peter identifies, the sufferings of Christ and links it to the glory that will follow in the kingdom age. So 1 Peter 1 and verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, you prophesied of the (coughs) grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. And this theme of sufferings and glory then gets picked up time and again through 1 Peter. So 1 Peter 2 and verse 20, For what glory is it if when ye are buffeted for your fault, ye shall take it patiently? 
But if when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. For hereunto were we called, because Christ also suffered, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. And it goes on to talk about him bearing uh, our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Uh, and lastly in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 4, verse is 1 and 2, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, I myself likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. And I reiterate that the following of the Lord Jesus Christ is a painful process. We are to live our lives as a living sacrifice to the will of God, to put to death in our lives the, the things which come so easily to us, so naturally to us, and to learn to put on in our lives and demonstrate in our lives uh, the godly characteristics which were expressed so perfectly in Jesus who is the example for us to follow uh, and in so doing if when if and when we come across this kind of suffering which I also suggest is is less common today for us than it has been in times gone past we, we, we may suffer a rebuke a mocking at our school our colleges our places of work we may suffer some harsh words as a result of our faith, but we're never going to be thrown to the lions as the first Christians were. We're never going to be scourged because of our faith. Uh, and yet, if and when we do suffer, in whatever way it is as a result of our faith in God and the Lord Jesus Christ, then let's remember that the disciples in Acts 5, they departed from the presence of the council having been beaten nearly to death. And yet they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer. For, for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's really the last facet of suffering that I think the Bible talks about. A p particular kind of suffering that comes as a, a result of being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to suffer because we're human, but then if we follow Jesus, then we will suffer as a result of our faith in some form or another. And yet, and yet, we do not be downcast because nothing can separate us from the love of God. And if we endure the sufferings because of our faith, we will, says the scriptures, be partakers of the glory of the age to come in the kingdom of God on earth. So let's conclude, uh, friends, let's, let's draw some conclusions. When will suffering end? When will there be no more pain and death? What is the Bible's answer? To the suffering in this world. Well, simply put, it's the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to set up God's kingdom on the earth. Uh, and I want to go back to Hebrews 12 as our very last reference. Hebrews 12, and this time the first uh, three verses. Hebrews 11 has, has given us a catalogue of those who lived by faith in obedience to God, looking for the fulfilment of promises that were made so very long ago. And because we've got that cloud of witnesses of Hebrews 11, says Hebrews 12, seeing we are compassed also about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with endurance or patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. If ever we think about giving up because of suffering in whatever form it takes, let's think about Jesus and the suffering he endured, recognising that we're never going to come close to that which he endured, uh, and in so doing accomplished on our behalf. Thanks for listening.